Shabbat Shalom, Boka Tov, Mishpucha. Hi, I'm David Kornblum, and welcome to Through Jewish Eyes Ministry. Before I get started, I'd like to give a couple reminders, as usual. Um, we meet every second and fourth Saturday of the month via Facebook Live, 9 a.m. Eastern, as we are today. And we also do every Friday night a Shabbat candle lighting, which is at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Zoom. And those Zoom numbers should be posted on this page down below, somewhere on through Jewish Eyes down below. So please come, invite your family, your friends. Let's all go together as one. The Hebrew word for one is Echad, to worship and honor God in His Sabbath. Baruch Hashem. Well, today I want to talk about Sukkot. Sukkot is also known as the Feast of Tabernacles, the Festival of Shelters, the Festival of Boots, and also the Feast of Ingathering. Remember that, the Feast of Ingathering. Sukkot is also plural for Sukkah, which means booth or tabernacle. Take note, my family, Mishpucha, that Sukkot is the seventh and the last festival on the Bible, in the Bible calendar, as it is written in Leviticus 23, verse 20, uh, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33 through 36. And I am going to read that for you now. And the Lord spoke to Moshe, Moses, tell the Israelites, the 15th day of this seventh month is the festival of boots to the Lord. Sukkot, Sukkot in Yiddish. It will be, it will last seven days. On the first day, there will be a holy assembly. Don't do any regular work. For seven consecutive days, bring a sacrifice by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, there will be a holy assembly. Remember the eighth day, which we are in right now? It will be a holy assembly. Bring the Lord a sacrifice by fire. This is the last festival of the year. Don't do any regular work. Now, take note, Mishpucha, this commanded festival, Sukkot, recalls the 40 years that the Jewish people, the Israelites, dwelt in boots or tents while wandering through the wilderness after being delivered out of Egypt. Sukkot also celebrates the gathering of the harvest. Remember, bring all your produce, all your first fruits, the gathering of the harvest at the end of the agricultural year. Prophetically, Mishpucha, prophetically, this symbolizes the day when all God's people are gathered together in the kingdom for the second coming of the Messiah, Yeshua. Baruch Hashem, that's a good note to have in your mind. But when it says the eighth day, let me go back. It says in verse uh, 36 in uh, Leviticus 23, it says about the eighth day, it says, for seven consecutive days, bring a sacrifice by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, there will be a holy assembly. Now, in Hebrew, uh, the eighth day is shmi, 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 uh, excuse me, Shemi Atzretz, which means eight days. And eight days is a holy gathering. Also, remembers the end of the remember it's the end of the agricultural year and the beginning of Israel's raining season. Now, remember, if it doesn't rain, what happens in in the spring? No food, no produce. You know, and also Sukkot. It is a joyful holiday. It's a joyful feast, realistically. It's God with us, God protecting us, and also going with us through our trials and our tribulations, okay? And the one thing, it's almost like what I could say, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the biblical Thanksgiving, realistically, because for seven days, we're feasting, we're celebrating onto the Lord, for thanking Him for being with us and for getting us through everything in our life that gives us trials and tribulations. Now, on the on the traditional side of it, we have Simcha Torah, which is uh, which means rejoicing in the Torah. What that is is that you know how in in um, how the Jewish people and also the people that follow the Messiah and that keep Torah observant every Friday, every Saturday they read from the Torah. Well, this ends the Torah cycle. And we restart it again for the new year. And what happens is at the end of this day, which would be probably t today and tomorrow, we take the Torah scrolls out of the arks in all the temples and synagogues around the world. And we dance and we rejoice in God's commandments and God's word and God's holy instructions for our life. So, but that is the traditional side of it. So we have uh, Shmini Atzret, which means the eighth day. And we have Simcha Torah, which means we rejoice in the Lord and we just celebrate God's instructions. But to get back to the Sukkot, you know, sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, David, that's the Old Testament. You know, that's not for me. 
Well, let me read again. Let me go to Leviticus, the Torah, 23, uh, chapter 23, verse 39 through 43. And it says this. It says, however, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered what the land produces, remember what I was saying, we gather what the land produces, uh, the uh, harvest, celebrate the Lord's festival for seven days. The first and the eighth day will be worship festivals. Baruch Hashem. Verse 40. On the first day, take the best fruits, palm branches, the branches of leafy trees, poplars, and celebrate in the presence of the Lord your God for seven days. It's, a, it's, it's the Lord's festival. Celebrate it for seven days each year. This is a permanent law for generations to come. Now, before I read any further, I'm actually reading out of, out of uh, I think it's the GWI uh, version with the GWT version of the Bible. I'm not actually reading this from the Hebrew Bible because I know there were a few discrepancies when you read from the original Hebrew to a lot of the other translations. And I really wanted to read these scriptures to you from a translation that you would basically see in churches and, you know, wherever you go. These are more of a translation you would see. So when it says... This is a permanent law. You know, other versions will say this is a perpetual law, which means never ending or changing. And, or it, it, will, it will say this is a law where this is a commandment forever, which in Hebrew is leolam, it means forever and ever. So it says forever. So when they say um, it's an Old Testament, when people say it's an Old Testament uh, writing, well, realistically, the word forever, I said this before and I'm going to say it again. The word forever in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, and the word forever in the New Testament, the Brit Shah, they basically mean the same. And it's like carrying that thing, oh, well, there's two sets of commandments, one for the Jews and one for everybody else. No, it doesn't work that way. There's one set of commandments, there's one Bible, and that's for everyone. <laughs> okay? And let me finish. Let me go back and finish. So, we celebrate it for seven days each year. This is a permanent law for generations to come. So basically permanent for generations to come. Celebrate this festival in the seventh month. Live in boots for seven days. Now listen, folks, this is a key verse. Every born, everyone born in Israel must live in boots so that generations to come may learn how I made the people of Israel live in boots when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. So... To me, Mishpucha, when I read that from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Scriptures, it is telling me that it is forever. Sukkot, forever. And Sukkot, as we say, Sukkot, you live in Sukkot. But then I hear that, well, this is for the Jews. I'm not Jewish. I'm a Christian. Well, I'm not Jewish. And I hear that a lot. And I want to say something to you. We really have to watch what we say. Because when people start saying, oh, that's a Jewish thing, or you're becoming Jewish, or you're doing this, no, you are who you are. Remember, the word says, come as you are. But when you start saying, this is a Jewish thing, you know, that's a very anti-Semitic thing. Would you actually say that to Yeshua? Yeshua, that's a Jewish thing. Well, let's not forget, Mishpucha. Yeshua is Jewish. He's a Rebbe. He's a rabbi. He was the Mashiach, but he's a rabbi. He was the greatest teacher that ever walked the earth. Baruch Hashem. So before we make those kind of statements, let's think. And like I said to you folks, I know that a lot of people say that. And I don't get mad, reason being, because I know that's not, I, I, I could see their heart. That's, it's just a worldly thing. Remember, hate is easy to do. Love is a little harder, especially in the world that we live in. Let's love more than we hate. Baruch Hashem. Amen. But let me read this when they say that is a Jewish thing. Well, that's for the Jewish people. I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a Gentile. Well, it says this. From Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 13 through 15, it says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, seven days after you have gathered in the threshing floor and your wine press. And you, verse 14, and you shall rejoice in your feast. Your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the Goyim, the foreigner, the stranger, the Gentile, for the, or, and the orphan and the widow who are within your gates. You shall celebrate the festival for seven days to the Lord your God in the place where the Lord has chose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all, in all your produce and in all the works of your hands. Therefore, you will indeed rejoice. Wow. Mishpuka, I couldn't say it any better than that. That is, and this is why when I say something from the scripture, 
I don't like to, I, when I'm teaching, I don't like to say my own words. I like to say 90%, 85% of what I get from the scripture because I'd rather you hear God's word than my words, realistically. So, you know, take it to the God, take it to the word and read it for yourself and you'll see what I just read to you. Now, about the Jewish thing, listen, we're all one in Messiah. Romans chapter 11, I think it's chapter 11, verse 24. It says that the Gentiles are grafted into Israel. Listen, you partake in everything, the blessings, but also the obedience, What's good for Israel is good for the, for the Gentile because we come that one. Also, in Leviticus 30, 23, 41, it's a Sukkot, what we keep forever. So, listen, Mishpoka, when it says forever, like I said, it's forever. You know, if God, God is not a God of confusion. If God meant it to stop when Messiah came, he says, oh, okay, when Mashiach comes, we stop everything. Now, he never said that. It's nowhere in Scripture. So, like I said, read Scripture, study the Word, study the Bible. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's amazing. But then, what I see, oh, and I have also, but I want to say something else. I, forget, I have another scripture here I'd like to read. From the Torah, uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse uh, 15 through 16, and it says this, when it comes to uh, Jews and Gentiles, uh, non-Jews, that the Torah is for all. God's commandments are for everybody, and there's only one commandment for all. And it says this in Numbers 15, uh, verse uh, Numbers chapter 15, verse 15 through 16. One ordinance shall be for both the congregation of Israel, also for the Goyim, the non-Jew, the stranger, who sojourns with you. One ordinance forever and ever, Le'olam va'ed, in your generations as you are, so shall the stranger, the El Goyim, be before the Lord. It says it, that we're together forever, no matter what, with one ordinance. And then in verse 16, key verse, one Torah, one law, one code shall be for you, Israel, and for the stranger who so joins with you. Wow, that is heavy duty. But like I said, Mishpoka, we speak the truth. The word says the truth will set you free. Read the word, study the word, and I continually have to say that because faith comes by hearing. But now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just take it a step further. I'd like to talk about Sukkot and Yeshua, the Mashiach. And the reason being is because, like I said before, Yeshua was Jewish, is Jewish. He's coming back Jewish. He left Jewish, he's coming back Jewish. He's Hebrew. He was a Rebbe. And this, I want to read from Yochanan, John chapter 7, verse 1 through 19. And as I read this, I'm going to kind of explain it with you so we're on the same page. It says this in verse 7. After this, Yeshua traveled throughout Galilee. He didn't want to go to Judea because the Jewish authorities, the, uh, the, the, the Pharisees, wanted to plot to kill him. When it was almost time for the Jewish festival, Feast of Boots. Now, when it says Jewish festival, Mishpucha, I really like to take that word out and just put when it was time for God's festival, holy festival. Because realistically, sure, it started with the Jews, but it's an everybody's festival. Anybody who believes in Messiah and in Hashem. Uh, uh, verse 2, let me go back. When it was almost time for the Jewish festival, Feast of Boots, Sukkot, Yeshua's brother said to him, leave Galilee, go to Judea, so that your disciples can see the amazing works that you do. Now, I can almost see that this is coming to be like a little bit, not such a, maybe an antagonistic way of saying it. And it says in verse 4, those, and this is, this is a key verse to that, those who want to be known publicly don't do things secretly. Since you do all these things, show yourself to the world. Now, verse 5, key, his brothers said this because they didn't believe in him. Well, you have to understand, you know, through Yeshua's life in the, in the uh, Brit Adashah, the New Testament, there's only a few records of his life growing up. The first one is... Uh, when he was born in Bethlehem. The second one, on the eighth day, when he was circumcised by a moil, you know, and named uh, in the temple. And then, when he was 12 and 13, during the time he would have been bar mitzvah, during the Passover, the Pesach, when his family would go every year to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he was in the uh, uh, temple talking to the Pharisees at the time, and they couldn't believe how astonished it was. So you have his birth, his circumcision, when he was 12 and 13, right before, or during his bar mitzvah time. And then you have from his ministry, 33, 30 to 33. So those are the recollections of this. But when it says, because his brothers didn't believe him, listen, his brother Jacob, and that's another thing, 
James, when you read the name James, Yeshua's brother or any James in the Bible, realistically, those names are actually Jacob. In Hebrew, we say Yaakov. They were changed from James, uh, uh, Jacob to James. I don't know why, but it listen, that's between the publisher and God. But his brother Jacob and everybody around him, they didn't believe. Now, you got to remember, his brother grew up with him. He shared the same bed, well, the hay, <laughs> bed made of hay. He shared the same bathroom. He shared everything, maybe the same cups, the same dishes. And his brother never seen him walk on water when he was a young boy. I mean, listen, they were two brothers. They might have fought, you know, um, innocently. So his brother never seen, so his brother didn't believe him. And remember, Jacob didn't believe until after the resurrection. So his brother didn't believe him. And Yeshua replied, now you got to remember, Yeshua will not lie. You can't lie to, when you do something good, you can't lie about doing something good because actually then you make the something good <laughs> not that good. You know, you don't deceive somebody and, and do a blessing. So Yeshua, so we know that everything Yeshua is saying, he's telling the truth. So Yeshua replied, verse 6, you, anytime is fine, but my time hasn't come yet. Verse 7, the world can't hate you, but it hates me, though, because I testify that the works are evil. Verse 8, you go up to the festival, Sukkot, and I'm, gonna, and I'm not going to this one because my time hasn't come yet. Now we get to verse 9. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. Verse 10, however, his brothers left for Sukkot, the festival. Listen to this, Mishpukah. He went to not openly, but secretly. So he didn't lie to his brothers. So you got to know, I hear a lot of different stories, but he didn't lie to his brothers. He said, my time is not now. But Yeshua was listening to the Ruch HaKodesh with the Holy Spirit. He was listening to God, God's instructions. And I'm going to get even further down on that in this chapter. But he's listening to God. He told his brothers the truth. Listen, it's not my time yet. My time hasn't come. Because Hashem had other plans. Remember, Yeshua says, I don't know when I come back. Yeshua didn't know the future. Only God knows the future. No one knows the future, but only God. We can only see things to come by God's word in his Bible, by the prophetic of the Bible. So Yeshua didn't lie. So after his brothers left, his father said, you know what? I'm, I'm sure from the way the scripture says it, okay, now go. They're left. Now I want you to go in secret because I know that if they go and you go, they're probably going to make a big deal that you're there. Verse 11, so the Jewish leaders were looking for Yeshua at the festival. They kept asking, where is he? Where is he? And the crowds were murmuring about him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Some said, but others, he's deceitful. He does tricks. He plays tricks on people. Verse 13, no one spoke about him publicly for fear of the Jewish authorities, the Pharisees. Now, I've heard other people say that the Pharisees wore their zit seat, uh, the long zit seat. Now, see my zit seat? See, I heard people say that the Pharisees wore the extra long ones and they put the, tef uh, the tefillin right here, you see, the big ones to look cool. That's not true. They did it for authority, to put fear in the people because they carried the oral law, the Talmud. They carried the law. So people had to come to them about the law and they observed everybody. And Yeshua spoke of that too in the word. So that's why I really want to clarify that. But verse 14 goes, halfway through the festival, Yeshua went up to the temple and started to teach. Now, before I get further with this, for, in verse 14, when it says Yeshua went up to the temple and started to teach, listen, Mishpukah, if he wasn't Jewish and he wasn't a rabbi, there would be no way he would be allowed to go up even close to that beam to speak and to teach. There would be no, no way. Okay, so let's let's really clarify that there would be no way he would be able to do that. So they did recognize him as a Jewish rabbi. I just really want to say that. In verse 15, it says this, astonished the Pharisees, the Jewish leader asked, he's never been taught in one of our schools, in one of our yeshivas. How has he mastered the Torah, the law? Whoa, this just, oof, this just blows me away. The Pharisees, who are condemning him. Now, this really opens up, um, 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 this should open up your mind, put it this way in plain English. Why? Because when he was speaking of why do you do this and do that, the washing of hands is, is Talmud. That's his, the, the, in the mission. That's oral law. That's tradition. He was speaking on the Torah. They were saying that he was trying to do away, but uh, a lot of people teach that he was trying to do away with the commandments. No, he was doing away with, with man's law, not God's commandments. And this here simply says it because they were astonished that he knew the Torah so well and he hasn't been taught in Jerusalem in one of their schools. Listen, for instance, take note, Gamaliel, 
was the chief rabbi of the time. All the Jewish people who know who Gamaliel is today. He was he was uh, one of the most profane rabbis of all time. I love Gamaliel. Shaul, Paul, in the New Testament bragged about going to Jerusalem and studying on the Gamaliel. So if Shaul was to say, you know, and speak of the Torah, they would say, oh, well, because he studied on the Gamaliel in one of the elite yeshivas, one of the elite uh, uh, schools in Jerusalem. But Yeshua didn't. First of all, we know that God was feeding him wisdom and, 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 and anointed him, of course. But how is this so? Well, I want to take it back. I want to show you how really Jewish Yeshua is or how much of a rabbi he is. If you go to Luke 4, chapter 4, verse 16, just to give you a little bit of background, Yeshua's past as well, it says this, Yeshua traveled to Nazareth where he, where he grew up, the town he grew up in. So verse 16 again, Yeshua traveled to Nazareth, the town he grew up. On the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as he always did and stood up to read. So basically, what this is saying, that he stood up to read, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, Friday, Saturday, Shabbat, sundown to sundown, to go to the temple to teach. So if any questions about who Yeshua was, listen, he was a rabbi, he was a teacher, a carpenter, sure, but he also taught in the temple. He learned in his local town of Nazareth. He would go, like always, as a young student and also as a man to teach in the temple. Okay, so let me get back to verse 16. Yeshua responds when the uh, Pharisees in verse 15 were astonished about how does he know the Torah so well? Well, here it is, verse 16. Yeshua responded, my teaching isn't mine, but comes from the one who sent me. Hashem, God. Let me read that again. My teaching isn't mine, but comes from the one who sent me. Remember, Yeshua was perfect. He would not lie. Verse 17, whoever wants to do God's commandments, God's will, can tell you whether my teaching comes from God or it's my own speaking. So what is he He's saying? Listen, anybody who's following the Torah and following God's instructions are going to know that I'm not, I'm not teaching my own because that's not human. That comes right directly from God. Listen, folks, let's not kid ourselves. You can't translate that any other way. Baruch Hashem. Verse 18, those who speak on their own glory for themselves, wait, excuse me, those who speak on their own glory seek glory for themselves. So, <laughs> wow. So, what this verse is saying in verse 18, those who speak of their own self, but anything that they're doing that, this is their word, this is them, they did this, they did that, they brought this, they did that, they saved this, they fed this, they did that. Well, listen, <laughs> This says this, this, they seek glory for themselves. Those who seek glory of him, Hashem, God, who sent me are people of truth and there is no falsehood in them. Didn't Moses give you the Torah, the law? Yet none of you keep it. Why do you plot to have me killed? Whoa. So Yeshua is saying, listen, anybody who recognizes themselves and says, well, I did this, I did that, realistically seeks glory for themselves. I didn't say that. The Bible said it. So please, anybody around the world, don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. Baruch Hashem, I'm just reading the word. It says that you seek glory for yourself. It's just, listen, as I say to the people I work with in ministry, and I actually said it last night during Shabbos, this is a group effort. It's not about one person. If somebody is in need Listen, everybody's got their numbers. You know where they live. You can email them, send a smoke signal up. It doesn't matter who you send it to, me or anybody that volunteers to help this ministry. Do it because the glory is always going to go to God, to Hashem and the Messiah, Mashiach, Yeshua for teaching us and being our ultimate sacrifice and paying the atonement for what we couldn't pay for. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. But my family, you have to understand, like I said, Listen, Yeshua is only telling us to what? To keep the commandments, to do what God said, to have a holy life. Listen, I continually will say this. Faith is the root of our salvation. Faith through grace. Faith is the root of our salvation, but obedience is the fruit of our salvation. Faith without works is dead. Remember what it says in the scriptures about that. And also the body without the spirit is dead. My family... What I'd like to do now is I'd like to go now into the Messianic prophecy. I'd like to go in the millennium and see the future. You know, one of the most saddest things 
that I've noticed around the world is that at least 85% of the churches around the world have not even mentioned Sukkot and that we're supposed to do it and they don't even bring it up. And maybe they'll say one little thing on the Feast of Tabernacles, but it's like it was yesterday and it doesn't count for today. Listen, you saw what I read. You heard what I read. You, you have the scriptures. You can replay this, this, this teaching and, and look them up again. It says forever for the Jew and for the Gentile. There's no discrimination. We're together. Listen, we are all part of the human race. White, black, brown, yellow, pink. I don't care what color you are. We are all part of the human race in the, and made in the image of Hashem of God. So let's come together as a family, the world, and let's, let's, let's conquer the Satan. Let's conquer evil. But I want to go into the millennium, and I want to read this. Listen, if you're not going to do Sukkot now, I hope that you still have breath and life in you before Mashiach comes back. Because listen to what it says in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 through 19. And it reads as this, verse uh, 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which have come against Jerusalem, Jerusalem, shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Melech, the Lord of hosts to keep the Feast of Boots, Sukkot. Listen, it says it shall come to pass. So that means it's coming. It hasn't come yet. That everyone who is left of all the nations who came against Jerusalem shall go up year to year. Well, we have to know that hasn't happened yet because all the nations that come up against Israel are still around and they do not all go up to, Suk to, to Israel for Sukkot, for Sukkot. We know that for a fact. Listen, don't kid yourself. You know, don't watch none of the fake news. Let's watch the real news. And that's the Holy Bible. That will tell you what's to come. Uh, verse 17. And it shall be that whoever will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, up, upon them there shall be no rain. So basically, it's saying that everybody on the earth that doesn't go up to Jerusalem. Now that goes to tell me that what Yeshua said that the road to Hell is wide and easy, but the road to life is hard and narrow, and very, very few find it. This is basically from, this is what I see when I read this part here in Zechariah, in Zechariah. But now verse 18 says, and if a family of Egypt does not go up and does not come, they will have no rain. This shall be a, the plague with which the Lord will strike the nations that do not observe the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, verse 19. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not, do not come up to observe the Feast of Booths. Wow. Baruch Hashem. Wow. So this is for the world. So if God commanded us to do it from the Old Testament and Yeshua did it in the New Testament and told him that he didn't do away with God's commandment to Torah. Listen, if you have any doubt about that, go. I have a teaching on Matthew Yahoo, Matthew 5, 17 uh, on this page. Please go down below. There's a whole bunch of other uh, teachings down there. I like to, when I, like I said, when I teach, I like to give you the truth right from the word. That's why I, lead a, I read a lot of scriptures to you. But if you want more information and you want to read a good book or a good, great chapter on the millennium and you want to know what's to come, start reading, I would say, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8. Read that chapter from beginning to end. It's not a big chapter, but Mishpucha, it will just, it will tickle your spirit and it will make you think and then you want to read more. Baruch Hashem. But what I'd like to do, uh, bringing this to a close, I'd like to look and see what happens at the end and what the Lord says. So, if you don't celebrate Sukkot now, I pray to God that you still have breath to celebrate it when the Mashiach comes back, if we see him in our lifetime. But in the end, Mishpoka, what does it say in Revelations 21.3? It says this, verse 3, chapter 21. And I heard a great voice out of the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the Sukkot of God is with men, and he shall stand dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Oh, but look what that says, my family. Amazing that in the end, God is going to have a sukkah with us and tabernacle with us and sit with us and be with us forever and we shall be his people. 
Mishpuka, I, I, I can't, I, it, my, my spirit just jars when I see people, they, they don't think that these, how could, listen, if God's word doesn't mean the same thing in the Old Testament that it does in, in, the, in the New Testament, from the Tanakh to the Bread of the Shah, I mean, then how can you believe in any of the promises? The promises God made to Israel, please, if you're, if you're a believer and you're not Jewish, you better pray that he keeps those promises to Israel because what if God won't keep his promises to Israel, what makes you think that he'll keep his promises to you? God is honest. He's true. He's the only true living God. Listen, and I didn't give you this uh, teaching to scare you or to give you any kind of scare tactics. No, I give you this teaching because if I don't, I won't be able to sleep. You know, when the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and mind, you know, Hashem doesn't say to me, David, do it, do this, do it. No, he comes to me in his word. He comes to me and, and I wake up and I see the vision in, the, in his word and what he's doing and, and I walk into it. Listen, when God is leading you and you surrender so hardly, you know, there's no way around it. You, God is going to put it in your path and he's going to light up your way. But I heard I hear a lot of people quote this this this, this scripture from Revelations twenty two fourteen. Now this verse here I read it in so many different translations. I actually went back to the Codex, you know, the Sept and the Septuagint to read this verse and to see exactly what it's saying. But listen to what it says in Revelations twenty two fourteen. It says, "Blessed are those who do His commandments." Listen, Mishpucha, there are not like I said before. There are not two separate commandments: one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. No, we're together. We're in this together. Baruch Hashem. It says, "Blessed are those who do His commandments. They that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city." What? Blessed are those who do His commandments. That they may have the right. The right. Listen. 1 John. Do you want to know how to please God? 1 John 5, uh, 2 to 3. Showing God love is being obedient to his word. Uh, 1 John, Yochanan 2, cha uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 3 through 6. Listen, my family. The way to show God love, listen, is by grace that we are saved but how do we show God? Look, listen, you just don't have grace and, okay, uh, I can do what I want. No. No. By showing God that you believe in his word and following what he's saying and his instructions. Listen, those instructions weren't put there for nothing. And Revelation chapter 14, 12, what does it say? In the trials and tribulations, in the great tribulations to come. It says to the saints, the believers, the only way to get through this is what? The first thing that is said is keep God's commandments. And don't lose your faith in Messiah. Keep the commandments and don't lose your faith in Messiah. And another uh, reference would be Revelations chapter 12, verse 17. Let's pray. Father, I come before you throne with the heart of thanksgiving to give you all the praise and glory. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. You are the only true living God. You are our Father, our Abba. You are the rock of our salvation. And there is no other. Father, I pray for all the people that are listening to this, this teaching, this message, I pray that you remove the veil from their eyes. And if anybody has a hardened heart, unharden their heart. But Father, let everybody see your word clearly the way you intended for them to see. Let them see, know, and acknowledge what Yeshua was speaking of and what he came to do for us. Not only what he came to do for us and the sacrifice that he made for us, but also what he taught and what he taught us how to live your word in trueness. And to love you, Father, with everything that we have, mind, spirit, soul, and also, Father, to love our neighbor as ourself. As we know, all the commandments are hung on these two commandments. And I pray that anybody who doesn't know you, Father, doesn't know the Messiah, I pray that you remove the veil from their eyes, unharden their hearts, that they will receive you, receive Yeshua, and know what you did and know what Yeshua did on the tree for our sins. Father, I know there are a lot of hurting people around the world, in America, and all over the world with this coronavirus, this plague. Lord, I pray for a healing upon them and in their families. I also pray that you provide their spiritual needs, financial needs, and, and anything medical or physical food. I know a lot of people have lost their jobs. Father, I pray and I ask humbly with the heart of thanksgiving that you, you open up a door for them, that they will get a better job to take care of their families. For a man that doesn't work will not eat, or a woman. Father, so I ask that in your holy name. And I also pray 
that we love each other. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kivu, Malak Utol, Le'olam, Vo'ed, Omein, Shalom, Peace to Jerusalem forever and ever, Omein, and Baruch Haba, Vashem Adonai. Mishpucha, until the next time, may God have His right hand on your life, that whatever you do, wherever you go, He will direct your path. And for those of you who are interested in this ministry, or just want to ask questions or connect with me, listen, message me on this page through Jewish Eyes or go to our website through jewisheyes.org. Send me a letter, Mishpucha, let's connect. Let's become one in Messiah, Baruch Hashem. Until next time, God bless and Shalom.